What's up, Ray Class? It's Wabacha here with my good old co-host Hegemony. Hegemony. What's up, guys? And then also we have Rory Rackham, not Ratchcam, <laughs> like I suggested on the subreddit, but Rackham from Grinding Gear Games. How you doing, Rory? I'm doing good, guys. How are you guys doing? Oh, good. Really excited. I'm doing to awesome. Do this. Really, really happy to talk, uh, get to talk with you again. Awesome. Awesome. Let's let's talk then. All right. Well, let's just go ahead, go right into it. Now, Rory, if you would like, could you give us a quick story of how you started at Grinding Gear Games? Ooh, or how you found okay. out about it? Um, yeah, I had just come back from Japan and I needed a job badly. And so I thought oh, I'll probably just have to work in a cafe again, just like beforehand. Um, so I applied at a bunch of cafes and I saw that there was one game studio hiring. So I thought might as well go for it and uh, ended up getting the job as a QA. So I was the one person doing QA for the game for uh, about a year or so, I guess. Um, actually, probably less than that. Someone else joined uh half a year afterwards, but I was uh, leading QA, but it was back before the game had even gone into beta. It was still an alpha, so there wasn't a huge amount going on. There were hardly any people working at the office at the time. Um, and so as it grew, I changed from QA to doing a bit of unique design. I started doing uh, supporter uniques, working with the diamond supporter packs, the, the oldest of the supporter packs that let you design items. Mm -hmm. So I designed items uh, for a while and then uh, at one point I designed a skill and after that I became the person designing most of the skills and then eventually got to a boss fight and now and then when it came to Act 4 I did a lot of the design work on most of the way through Act 4 uh, working with the art director um, who did all of the artistic side of things and the story and so on um, but now I do pretty much focusing on skill design um, but also a bit of stuff on bosses and that kind of thing. Some uniques now and then. That's very cool. How old was the company when you joined? Uh, it must have been about three years. No, two, two or three years old. Although oh, okay. those, those two or three years, I mean, the first year or two were just getting the engine up and working sort of thing. There were three people in the company for quite a while. So it was still uh, in its infancy when I arrived. Um, and that was four years ago now. So, yeah. They need to update that grindinggeargames.com website. Because it says your quality assurance. <laughs> yep, yep. I think half the staff aren't even on that at the moment. So oh, really? We'll update it oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a picture of like 16 <laughs> people or something. <laughs> and before grinding your games, you were a, a professional MTG player, weren't you? Uh, no, that is someone completely different. Uh, oh, it's I, a different person. Oh, wow. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was a student i guess so uh, this was my first game development job as was most of the people's in the company's first game development job um so yeah there's not a huge game industry over here in new zealand so this is one of the few <laughs> so who is the professional mtg player then uh that's probably brian weissman who is one of the uh, founding members um uh, uh, who yeah so okay. magic players might recognize his name but he comes over to new zealand occasionally and helps out yeah all right all right well, go ahead, Hedgy. Oh, that was that was my. Uh... Oh well, you didn't. Well, okay. So, here's another break the ice question. Then, how would mm -hmm. you get rid of a dead body? Um, There's I a right answer to this, by the way. <laughs> well, you, the police, assuming that they people knew that someone had gone missing, the obvious thing would be to bury it or something like that. So, I would just probably leave it in a public place as a sort of modern art uh, thing. And so people would just think that it was meant to be there. So no one would think anything about it. It's what they least expect. Oh, the right answer was hoping... detonate dead. No. Yeah. <laughs> we were hoping. You, yeah, we were really hoping. Detonate dead. Oh. Oh, well. <laughs> or abyssal cry or shatter them with hatred. <laughs> yeah, anything, anything. <laughs> it's all right. All right. Well, if you guys want to see a day in the life of rory at ggg go ahead check out his uh the skill or the developer manifesto with your your uh skill with dichot dichotomy is that what she called it um yeah yeah or something something like that or yeah Going skill to... ecology that's what it is yep that's the one that's yeah the one. yeah that's that's essentially what rory does yeah, that's yeah. a that's a very simplified simplified version actually. There's a there's a right. hundred more steps going like mostly working with other developers. Like that's one of the things that's hard to get across is how much feedback um, everyone has right. on all this stuff. Um, 
we could get feedback from everyone in the company to make the best possible skill, except then it would take half a year to get through it all and make everyone happy with it. But yeah, yeah, that's the gist of it. Yeah. Right. So do you have somebody siphoning feedback for you, like to to like show you what's pertinent or what needs to be addressed? Or are you like how much of your day is actually getting feedback? Uh, a lot of, I mean, most of the time it's getting feedback, but it could be from people. We have a few really experienced players of the game in the office and a few people who are sort of normal players, um, mm -hmm. which we, whenever we try out a new skill, we get feedback from them. Uh, some people, uh, I kind of think that unsolicited, like feedback where you tell people to give you feedback isn't quite as good as when people just come up to you and be like, I've been playing the skill and I happen to have these thoughts on it. That's sort of the most useful thing because they mm -hmm. care enough about it to show that it's important. But we have a, a broad selection of people and people who are just really familiar with the, the code and so on and can see these will be the long-term consequences of the skill. So there's a lot of different kinds of feedback and the artists nice. as well. Obviously that's super important like when making a skill you've got to go to an artist and be like how will this look when it's actually made we know how it works mechanically whether it's gonna be fun or not but people like how it looks is probably the most important thing of is whether people think the skill is powerful or not um, really so there yeah. have been there have been skills that have been shot down just because they don't look good Yes, yes, we've had, had a few like that and a few that have sort of gone back to the drawing board. Okay, we need to add something else to the skill so it looks or it feels better. How it feels, like a lot of people just pick up the skill, play through the the starting area with it, and if it doesn't feel like it's punchy or it doesn't feel like it's uh, smooth, if it feels mm -hmm. like out of place in the game, then then it's back to the drawing board with it. On, on the same note, um, you've teased us a long time ago and you know you have to know that we'd never forget but you told you told us that there were the inner workings of herald of stone and anarchy uh can you yes. elaborate on like what happened with the uh these skills or what's going on with them so the goal of herald of stone when we first came up with it was to provide an advantage for being up close in melee and for being hit and since we came up with that plan we came up with better ways to do it. Uh, the counterattack gems were the sort of the simple, like this is just a straight up a reward for hitting, for blocking, that kind of thing. Um, and we just introduced more things like fortify and so on. That sort of filled the role that Herald of Stone was going to have as the, the herald for melee attackers. Um, we'll probably introduce something similar again in future, but it will be like when melee needs something that we feel like they're missing, then we'll introduce Herald of Stone or Herald of Blood or whatever the physical equivalent is going to be. Mm -hmm. mm. Herald and of Herald of Anarchy? Uh, that is something that we had sort of said we could do it so that we have a set of five, but now that we have the Contagion and Essence Strain with a um, combo, we'll probably introduce a new Herald of Anarchy to design to go with the Chaos Degen spells, especially if we start introducing more Chaos Degen spells in the future, which we likely will, because they've been quite popular looking at the statistics. Nice. Well, thank you for that beautiful, beautiful talk about the Chaos spells. One of the next questions <laughs> that we have is actually, um, are, are there any concerns or discussions with the double dipping damage that we have with the new poison skills? And are you guys happy with the current regeneration rates? Or, uh, that's kind of a follow-up question, I apologize, but yeah, like, is there any concern with the double dipping of Chaos Damage spells? Uh, there's definitely concern, we've talked about it a bit, especially when we were going through the community questions and answering exactly what works, what applies to poison damage and the hit damage. Uh, we kind of realized that this is a very convoluted, this isn't a straightforward system, and mm -hmm. it has the, the negative effect of the only way to use this effectively is to use everything that double dips with it rather than the single hit stuff. Meaning people can't just pick up and use poison. They need to be uh, getting the most out of it with double dipping in order to make it as powerful as possible. Right. Um, for a quick uh, breakdown, just so people understand what I mean by double dipping is when you have in a stat like increased damage that applies to both the hit and then after the hit to the poison damage as well. So it effectively gets times 1.1 times 1.1 if you've got 10% increased damage. Right. And like projectile damage, area damage, things like that. Mm -hmm. And resists as well as a tricky one. Resists is the thing that means we can't just turn off double dipping because resists need to apply as damage is dealt rather than in advance. Right. There's a bunch of complex, it's sort of like this is changing the code base for how 
half the damage in the game works if we want to improve this. So it's not a let's just do it. It's a sort of we need to, again, consult lots of different people in the company for their feedback on how it will affect their characters or their code or various skills, right. including monsters and so on. It's, it's a big change. So it might not happen in the next three months, but hopefully in the next six. That's what I'm hoping for. Now, with that said, um, now this is specifically um, with the Beano's uh, kitchen knife. Are you guys happy with like the regeneration? Or when you guys see this insane regeneration players are able to achieve uh, life regeneration that is uh, what are your thoughts on that you know because that's kind of it's not so much the damage but that's like some really insane survivability yeah it's it's something we're looking at there's no like it's not broken per se so it's tricky to just like say we're changing it right. um, obviously the adjusting how we calculate damage over time is going to make a difference to how we how much regen be knows we'll be giving but we're, we've been looking at it. We've been thinking about it. We don't want to rush into it. We don't want to make a hasty change and ruin people's characters completely. We'd like it. I mean, it's cool that it's a thing, right? Like, it's a fun... Mm -hmm. you know, they're using an attack weapon for its one specific mod to get this awesome defense on whatever character you're on. Um, so it slipped it, through their cracks, and you're going to let us play with it for a bit longer. <laughs> uh, unless, unless it gets out of hand, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to say go wild when if you go truly wild, we're like, nope, this is just ruining the game. Obviously, we don't want like the worst possible outcome is everyone feels like they have to be doing the same thing, and so they never get to enjoy all the thing other things they could be doing in the game just because they're slightly less efficient. We want people to experiment. So if yeah. that makes you immortal, then why wouldn't you use it? But it doesn't quite make you immortal. It has its downsides, but it's still... You guys like when the community comes up with like really strong things, but like when it's too broken, like the blink arrow or the mirror arrow, uh, what was it? I mean, an instability. I mean, you guys were quick to fix that because that was just, you know, outright broken. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's always like there's 10 different mechanics that combine together to one crazy thing which is exactly what happened with the minion instability blink arrow th um stuff which is like the coolest thing about the game and also the most uh, stressful thing for us it's and it's hard to know like we often test out these builds and they're really good but there is one factor that was missing or right. it was like slightly better in this other situation that makes it seem a lot or even just it becomes really popular there's some stuff that's just as powerful that we know some people are playing it just isn't filling out the statistics with the majority of players are using this weapon or this skill mm -hmm. they come and go well speaking of the programming and i know you have a lot of interaction with the programmers and when i was designing my unique with nick uh, mm -hmm. i i was explained that there were limitations with desync that prevented him from implementing certain mods that would be like definitely unique like whether it be like knockback distance or things like that and basically a lot of the things were shot down you know having different kinds of stats for however many charges you had he said it it, it was a problem with the code but now that you guys have like essentially fixed a lot of your net code or eliminated it for those that have very low pings are there skills that were you know sidelined because of that because of that mechanic and now they're like actually you know being redeveloped or looked at again uh there's always a constant stream of things that we couldn't do before that we can now we're always getting new tech um not just because of the lockstep changes but uh just we've implemented something tricky for something else like often for a new league or something like that that now lets us do crazy things uh like back where we had the nemesis league uh we added right. a thing that let monsters do skills and now we can have monsters doing skills without performing animations all through the game and we're starting to be able to apply it to players and well in a different way and that sort of thing there's a bunch of stuff uh triggerable skills are now a lot easier to do and um, items that grant skills that do various things and also once there's a precedent and we know it's popular then we'll start introducing it a lot more yeah, you can see the speed at which you guys come out with stuff because you guys are getting like better at it. Like once you in incorporated Halls of the Grand Master, I mean, a lot of the AI was put into that, and you guys have been mm. pumping out new and new exiles because I guess it's, you know the code is there and you know the options are there now. It's it's, it's very cool, but 
Yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting. Releasing new skills is probably the thing that enables us to do the most other new content because we can have monsters doing something similar or items doing something similar or referring to the skill or something like that. So uh, the, because we've got a bunch of crazy, like uh, Contagion and Essence Strain and uh, Blade Vortex were all very... Uh, cutting edge tech like there were things there were heaps of things we hadn't done before that will now mean we can do new things with monsters and maybe even items and so on so speaking of new skills this is something that's very very this is a very popular question but mm -hmm. um are there any or let's see i want to word this correctly but for val skills i know a lot of people ask are we going to be getting some new val skills is there like a criteria that has to be met or in order for something to be considered to be a Val skill? And then if so, you know, what's a what's a skill, this is just like your personal opinion, not speaking for everybody, but is there a skill that you would like to see added as a Val version? Yeah, so Val skills are a tricky one because there's a strong thematic part to them. A lot of people that care a lot about the, the Val theme want a bunch of new Val skills, like Return of the Val as a something like that that we could do but then again it's getting to the point where there's so much other story to be told that we just want to re release some more vile skills so there is talk of more vile skills sometime in the next six months so i can't really reveal what they are but uh going pushing for some sort of personal ultimate mode where you activate your your super awesome form and you're awesome for a short time but you can't keep it up all the time maybe you're more restrictions than other vile skills or something like that it's something that we're looking at except uh again this hasn't been run past a programmer yet so it could easily get shot down for a hundred different reasons so um, are you saying the vile skill it needs to be in theme with the current league or with the current state of the game or do you use vol skills to fill like uh, or use them as opportunities to fill or fix or bat rebalance metas it's uh previously in the past we've turned down vol skills because we didn't want to release just one vol skill by itself it felt a bit weird that there's only one new vol skill coming out even though we've had some cool ideas for vol skills things that would improve slots in the game uh, in time, we'd like every build to have a possible, you know, they can add a Val skill if they want a Val skill. Um, when we released the last set of Val skills in the Sacrifice of the Val expansion, we added the Val auras just so that there is something that anyone could use if they wanted to use a Val skill. And we've had some very popular ones from those ones that were added just because anyone, almost anyone can make good use out of Val haste um, and similar skills. So we will probably introduce more like so that chaos degen skills have a vile skill they can use and maybe physical spells have a vile skill they can use it's something we're keen on but it doesn't have quite the same uh that some vile skills are just as much work as a brand new skill by itself but they don't have quite as much use rate like when you look at the list of skills people are using vile skills even vile heist are much lower than the other skills than the basic skills mm -hmm. um generally it's a better better for player numbers and player growth to just introduce a brand new skill than a val skill of something but we're definitely going to release a, a few sometime in the next six months i'd like to say but that's well, my just, plan anyway just a segue into a different question that we had later on but I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you now like what is your opinion on the current state of val spark it's definitely too effective at what it does we're looking at ways to uh bring it in line with other skills but at the same time it's an awesome build like it's an awesome thing to do we mm -hmm. don't want to stop people doing the the vile spark build if they really invest in it currently it's too cheap to do really you can just slap on a few jewels and uh it'll mess everything up uh, it's not the best in some situations but it's good in all the situations that you care about so right yeah yeah yeah, That's... I mean, I think a lot, a lot of the community members were just surprised that, you know, its interaction with specifically jewels, you know, Sacrificial Harvest and, uh, mm. you know, you mm. being able to use m multiple copies and things like that. We thought that there surely was coming, uh, you know, surely there was going to be a nerf. But uh, I guess you guys started with the Surgeons, right? It's a Surgeons mm. reduction. Mm. Yeah. And, and you were hoping maybe that would bring it more in line or make it a little bit more difficult to play. Yeah. but it's still rewarding but, i don't know yeah I mean, yeah like i said we don't want to stop people playing it entirely so gotta be right. careful with it um but 
Uh, I know more changes are planned. I just can't say what. Uh, there are people who care a lot more about that sort of stuff than I do. I'm mostly about making shiny new things. <laughs> easily yeah. distracted. Easily distracted. Uh, what is your current state on the, or what is your opinion on the current state of elemental proliferation, mainly with cold? <sighs> it's a it's a really tricky one because I mean partially because of cold damage, we can't let elemental proliferation become too good uh, because uh, in the past well we for a while we tried out having elemental prolif work off shattered corpses or apply immediately on use and it was absolutely devastating like you you never got attacked because everything was always frozen you just had stuff that lets you keep stuff frozen especially now that you can carry around a talisman that can spawn little monsters that you can freeze when you want um, we added the flat damage to uh, freeze mine just so that you couldn't keep monsters freezing stuff indefinitely with it um, so it's something we've tried to let you know let players have a bit more control with and it's ended uh, in a way that would just make the game way too easy so that's that's no fun so it's something we don't want to be too liberal with and we don't want it to be like it used to be where fire prolif was the absolute best thing you could be doing although obviously if we're making changes to how dgen works that won't be a as big a problem but yeah it's yeah it's, it's it's such a dangerous thing for the game where it's either everyone's using it or no one is we'd like to find a way to make it the middle ground but that's probably not by changing prolif it's rather changing the stuff around it and then rebalancing prolif to how it now fits in the, the game freeze mine was pretty ridiculous <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I just really would want to like to play uh, a glacial hammer prolif build, but uh, that's just so unre unrewarding to play at the moment. Mm. Yeah, it, it's tricky, but it's definitely yeah. something we've. It comes up in discussion every now and then. Can we now change prolif to be slightly more popular? Um, but yeah. Uh, go ahead, and ask your next question, Hedgy, because I actually I want to do something. Uh, so before. The community was really grateful when you when we saw graphical improvements and transparency with the certain mods that often ended people's characters' lives, like with Thornflesh and Reflection. Uh, mm -hmm. Can we expect to see any graphical improvements to showcase volatiles, you know, their elements? So I feel like if, if this was done, then maybe people wouldn't complain so much about the right side of the tree not having enough life. And, it, you know, it's not as punishing because that one is like, it's like a sleeper. <laughs> it's it's just in the middle of the pack. It's unless you're directly you know mousing over the the actual rare, you can't tell that it's going to end your life. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm not. I wouldn't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure there's something in the works for that. Uh, I'd have to check uh, myself, but I'm pretty sure there is so, someone's got an issue to add some effects to those um, to make them more visible, as well as a few other things that are dangerous. Um, I think maybe the corrupted blood might be getting one as well. I'm not 100 percent sure, but they they should be. It's, it's nice, definitely planned. Nice. Yeah, so the corrupted what if, blood bloodline could be really scary suddenly. Yeah. What is your opinion on the the current state of the right side of the trade? Are you guys happy that you know there are these unavoidable damage mods that exist, and do you feel like those are the culprits of people complaining about the right side? Because I I really enjoy the defenses on the right side. And they work pretty pretty damn well, but there's like that small percentage window where it's just so punishing. You feel like you have to meet these prerequisites of, you know, life and resistance because you can't you can't resist that. You can only avoid it. And a lot of, a lot of times mobs are swarming you, surrounding you, and you just don't get that chance to react because you didn't mouse over the the mob or whatever. But it's a it's a tricky one. I mean, my ideal solution would be having the right side of the tree get its defenses in more interesting ways. So it has a different defensive play style. You have more things like phase runs, uh, aggro avoidance and things like that that let you control or have moments of phasing out, something like that, that protect you rather than just straight up giving them more statistics because i mean the marauder is supposed to be the high life character the high defense character that's the one right. you, that i mean you go marauder for a reason if every class has the same level of survivability in statistically equal ways then it's i mean that takes away the 
one of the interesting aspects of specialization in your character. But it is true that it's a, I mean, it's a high risk, high reward part of the tree with the focus on criticals as well. It's really a big question, like a game philosophy question that not one person, especially not myself, could answer. But right. it's, I mean, we, we definitely hear the community talking about it a lot. And so we're aware of it being something that they're thinking about, but it's not something we want to rush into just by bumping up the numbers to be numerically equal all over the place. And on a, on a side note, when, when we talk about right side player defenses that are unique, are you happy with the current state of arrow dancing? Or do you um, see pe enough people picking it up? Looking at the stats, it's, uh, it's good. Like there's the right number of people taking, I mean, it's, close to most other keystones uh with the exception of the few that the really dangerous like the ones that the most popular keystone by a large margin is acrobatics at the moment but this is also to do with the meta of what builds are popular that happen right. to be going past acrobatics it's interesting that phase acrobatics significantly fewer people are taking phase acrobatics than acrobatics itself despite being one of the most powerful nodes in terms of mitigating uh spells damage but yeah, it's it's arrow dancing is still taken and is still quite powerful. Like I've seen it used to great effect. Uh, although that's kind of uh, evidence from just my personal personal experience. So others okay. might have different feelings on it. But it, it is being used and it is right. it does improve some situations a lot. Um, so when skills are being considered for a rework what are some of the red flags or the indicators that you guys you look to consider that it needs a nerf or a buff in general like what are some like the biggest things um how many people are using it is the most obvious thing but also if it's just got a problem that is trivializing some content that people say just switch to the skill like if if you just switch to the skill regardless of what your build is in order to do some things then that's a real problem. Um, but statistics are the biggest indicator. We know if there's a skill right at the top of the list, then even if it isn't 10 times more powerful, it's still good to push it out of what is popular at the time. So people feel like they have to play something different rather than every league. They have to play the same set of builds because they always know they're going to be good. Yeah. Um, and then... Um... Now, when a skill is nerfed, uh, a lot of a lot of members of the community, I'm sure you guys see this a lot, but they feel like it's uh, heavy-handed. Um, you know, a lot of people really thought Incinerate was you know very heavy-handed. Although we see mm. a lot of Chaos Incinerate, high-level builds still performing really well. Um, when you look back on it, um, what's what skills or what things have been changed that you feel like um, you want to revisit so it wasn't so heavy-handed? Uh, it's it's really tricky to put a number on that stuff because when we, we we are always careful when we lower these things we play the builds or we make modifications to the builds so they're now as a more effective you know they're now making the best use of the stats and the builds and they we make sure they're still playable they can get through the game with uh, as you would expect a character to be able to it's just there's always a few that stand above the rest that now make its new position so much worse and oftentimes if a skill is really good then people will be making more mistakes with their builds that when they now switch to using the skill they've got an inefficient passive tree or they've got an inefficient skill set up or just something that they wouldn't have done if they had been playing through the game more carefully and so now they're they a lot of people feel that their build has dropped in power far below what they should be expecting their character to be able to do so it's really hard to make a good guess on how much to nerf something by we always nerf it to what we think it should be and then buff it a little bit to bring it in line with what people are playing at the time uh there's no no particular one that i'm thinking about that's like i wouldn't have done it that way Elemental Other hit. Than, <laughs> well, elemental hit's a tricky one because I don't really like the skill. Uh, it's like got no. Does got anybody? No interesting. <laughs> it's got no interesting thing to it. There's no special twist on how you build it or play for it, other than how you spec in the passive tree or something like that. Um, we've tried in the past to make something that we would switch out for elemental hit, 
but it quickly became so different that it felt weird that this uh, single target attack skill has turned into something completely different, like Wild Strike or right. um, Burning Arrow or something like that. Um, so in regards to like current meta and popular builds, what are your thoughts are or what are your thoughts of CI attack in the current state of the game? Is the intent of CI to make make it more viable with these uniques that have been recently added, like Skyforce, which is very, very rare and expensive, which, I mean, it's really good. And things like Oxium that kind of solved attack, CI attack problems. But is that the intent that, you know, over time you guys will release things that will make CI better? Or, I mean, should they be pigeon held to using a lot of uniques to get it going? Or how do you, how do you guys feel about CI attack? CI itself is a really tricky one. It's always a... Like, it's taking a secondary t defense and turning it into your primary defense, even though that secondary defense has almost become a primary defense on its own, even for the hybrid characters, hybrid life ES characters. So it's such a difficult keystone to fit in anywhere. We want playing Energy Shield to feel different, um, which means it can never be the same balance-wise. It's got to have, you know, it has its downsides, so if it doesn't get life flasks and all that. And it, the, that portion of the tree isn't built for attacks either. You're missing out on attack damage you could be getting if you're going CI, um, and you just it's a it's a trap for new players. So going back to the old age of when CI was the thing that everyone has to be doing is probably what it would take to make attack something you can easily do with it. But if we can introduce uniques or skills or new passives that let attack witches, let alone a CI um, which has become more popular, then that's a good thing. I mean, there are a handful of uniques, but almost all of them are supporter uniques. So right. <laughs> they're trying to get supporter <laughs> uniques. Yeah, then we're going to keep getting little things. I'm always wary about making, like, you need to have Oxium and Crown of Eyes and all this stuff in order to make an attack CI build work. That's That's not great, but it's still i mean it is a niche build like it's we don't say to a new player you should be playing an attack which we don't introduce even introduce wand skills till halfway through the quest reward progression yeah i mean before i felt like see i did dif feel very different because it was a build that while you took a lot of damage you leached it all back you know as long as you were mm -hmm. actively attacking and playing aggressive you could get defense through just you know Taking a lot of damage but healing it all back because Leech was at a phenomenal rate and you had Blood Rage to Leech for you. So that kind of like freed up the, the Leech gem and made it felt, you know, but it it kind of felt like it got buried once Leech was changed. And I mean, we have yet to see a CI return. Um, I mean, Skyforth is a really good pair of boots, but <laughs> not everybody can afford yeah. it. And when you invest that much into the character and then you play the game, it becomes viable, yeah, of course, but. You know, is it really worth the currency and the time you put into it? Uh, but I, yeah, I, I like that. You know, it's something that you can aspire to do, something that's niche. And uh, yeah, it's a definitely a different way to play. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we have, the, I mean, looking at the statistics, it isn't used as much as other keystones, but it's still being used by quite a few people. So we'll probably push it up a little bit, but not give it some major change that will adjust how it works entirely. Um, more just like little little nudges until people or someone picks out a cool build that works with it and it then fits back into the play style again. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are playing it right now because of Whispering Ice. Whispering Ice. Ice. Yeah. Which is your baby, which I really enjoy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was that's my my thing. That was um a tricky one to get made for various reasons, but it definitely fits well with CI. Yeah. How many people did you have to fight, Rory? <laughs> You're like <laughs> Like it's, um, it's got to be good. There, there were heated. It was more the the fact that we're doing something we haven't ever done on an item before, having it grant a skill that can only be granted by that item. Although technically there is one other unique that did it, I think at the same patch that it came out with. But it was like a build entirely requiring this one item. Um, but I really wanted to try out and see if people liked the one build, the one unique build. I mean, we have face breakers. That's face breakers is the closest to whispering ice. I'd say in terms of, I guess I was jealous because someone else designed face breakers and I wanted my own face breakers. So nice. that, there come, that's where the whispering ice came from. 
Oh, you got it. Like, take that, Facebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now on to a question about Ascendancy, because you're in charge of the subclasses, right, for Ascendancy? Yeah, um, working wow. with Neon on it. Yep, yeah. yep. Um, how uh, the subclasses that we could actually see right now on the page, how finalized are they? Uh, it varies. We've spent a bunch of time playing with them. Most of them are going to get value adjustments. They're going to have a lower amount of this or that, but the effects that they're applying, we're pretty set on. Some are getting buffed is pretty much the, the most the biggest change you're going to see is that you're going to get new stats on the ones that we aren't thinking we're happy with like the guardian even though he gets uh is it no guardian In Inquisitor? The champion champion. Oh, champion um even though he gets the fortify for free um he still needs a little bit more interesting stuff on his other nodes so you have a reason to take the rest of his ascendancy tree um little things like that but they're probably going to be minor like get an extra sp little special stat to stuff to make it more appealing rather yeah, than big changes for the scion reveal <laughs> so actually that that actually kind of um works right into i had another question but i could use it as a follow-up but pretty much um now the inquisitor and the assassin subclasses they look they look really strong and myself included a lot of people thought it may have pointed to a possible re like a rework or an overhaul of an existing game mechanic is is that not really the case? Is it just more like, okay, well, these values are just going to be changed? Uh, it's more like the values are just going to be changed. Okay. We really want the Ascendancy trees to create different ways to build your characters. And so having some massive, massive focus on one mechanic or another is a good thing. Once they come out, remains to be seen. We have no idea what sort of impact these are going to have on the long-term game, whether everyone's going to want to try all the different classes, make a build that works with the assassin or whatnot, um, or whether they're going to try more, whether everyone's going to start using, every single person is going to play the Marauder so they can get the um, various juggernaut passives that make some content too easy or something like that. Right. Um, the, the in, defensive bonuses are usually more powerful than the offensive ones in these trees as well, which means it's a much bigger difference from hardcore. Like when we were going through the, like showing the trees to people for the first time, their first reactions to them while they were still in development, you get very different, like first reaction choices of this is what I'd go for based on what their play style is. Uh, in regards to Ascendancy, I mean, we can look at these things and see that there's a lot of power and a lot of specialization within them. Are you are you guys planning on uh, adjusting the difficulty of the game to go up, you know, in regards of the introduction to the, uh, the Ascendancy? Or is the, the overall game difficulty going to remain the same with the uh, specialization options? There will probably be some shifts, but they won't be generic monster ones of monsters now do 10% more damage or something like that. It will more likely be you'll see more of this mechanic, which is more dangerous, or uh, monsters will have better AI or use more skills once you get into cruel and merciless difficulty that add a bit more challenge, um, that kind of thing, rather than just a straight up uh, oh, players now do 10% less damage and monsters do 10% more to make up for adding ascendancy classes. That's a much more that's a much more exciting way to increase difficulty. Yeah, um, much much more work, but uh, hopefully yeah. we can pull it off. Yeah, for the players. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully you guys can still kill us. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what we like doing. No. <laughs> I can uh, see Roy twiddling his thumbs. <laughs> um, but uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Edgy. No, sir, go. Go for it. All right. Okay. Well. Uh, which Ascendancy class are you the most excited about if it's been previewed yet? Or has it been previewed yet? Uh, I honestly can't remember if it has been previewed. Uh, I'm... Well, just say it. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's probably one of the ones that haven't, hasn't been previewed yet, but mostly because we're going to be introducing some new skills to further enhance how the tree works, um, how that Ascendancy class works for the class that it comes from so it's more of a big picture thing rather than this, this there's one or two stats that i really like so so it's just yeah a, every, all of your knowledge is saying like oh this is going to be awesome uh it's more like this is going to be different this is going to feel like a new way to play the game um which should be good should be good but 
I can't tell you any more about it. So, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Vague answers. Yeah. As a as a game designer and balancer, like, do you? Uh, I mean, we've seen a lot of items that have a lot of. If you get more of this stat, you are you will do more damage. Uh, you know, like with Spring Ice, Pillar mm -hmm. of the Cage God, things like this. Is it easier to balance uh, because it scales or? Like, how does that go in designing uniques? We have the jewel brawn. We have that helmet that synergizes with uh, strength, dex, and uh, is it into? Or is it's, it just... it's pretty, f um, like, from coming up with how we're going to balance it, we sort of just make sure that it is possible to fit in a balance curve before we start work on the item. We say, okay, we can say, I mean, Basing off attributes is nice because attributes happen to have a similar curve to, like, it's a very smooth curve as you progress. It's almost like getting a bonus per level, except the players can choose to invest in it. And as players get more damage from other sources, we boost up the power of gems and so on and so forth. Uh, we also happen to introduce things that let you get more strength or more intelligence. Um, like Whispering Ice didn't get a boost to its... Uh, damage per int at the same time as we boosted all other spells at level 20 of the gem um, just because we had been introducing more stuff that let you boost your int as time went on it's sort of it happens to be that attributes work out well for the stuff but we're pretty limited we've tried doing stuff can we base it off accuracy or evasion or things like that and we hit stumbling blocks pretty quickly of there's no way the curves of those doesn't match anything else in the game we can't give you a a bonus per evasion unless it's some sort of more generic less straight up damage stat mm -hmm. and uh speaking of stats and attributes uh i'm not sure how much uh, your involvement in w was included in the threshold jewels i imagine some because they affect the skills but uh, nick is the one that designed them yeah that's right i i had a little bit of involvement i mostly just frowned at it because it's like <laughs> uh that that's a cool skill by itself. I could just make that a separate skill, but no, you just you just have it for a jewel. That's fine. Um, but yeah, I was I was involved in it a little bit. And um, did the thresholds jewels live up to your expectations? Are like so a lot of people using them? And the I mean, the quite a few people are using them. Not not a huge number. I mean, it's kind of not a huge number of people are using one specific skill unless it's like a movement skill or a utility skill. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard to judge from the statistics alone because obviously they're going to have a much lower number than the more general jewels. But uh, they do add, I mean, there's a lot of potential that they add. The thing that I'm worried about them is just that you now, if you, if Glacial Hammer's jewel is mandatory to play Glacial Hammer, which I don't think it is. But, uh, if if there was a jewel that made this skill usable, you now have to have that jewel to make the skill usable. But then at the same time, it enables this thing of we can make a level one skill feel like a level twenty eight skill by adding enough jewels to the character, which is something a player could do. It's sort of a very niche sort of. Johnny to refer to magic psychology sort of things, um, meaning that there is a people who like doing crazy builds, and they, these jewels are really for them first and foremost. And I think a lot of Nick's designs are for the the people who like doing cr some crazy builds, and then some small portion of them turn into the the end game meta. Um, we haven't seen it with a uh, threshold jewel yet, judging by the statistics, but. I think it's an only ma only a matter of time until we introduce a threshold jewel that's really fun and enables an entirely new build for a otherwise simple, um, not popular skill. I think mm -hmm. Valspark is a great example of that, actually. Like something that was okay for quite a while. A lot of people used it in a trap, but now it out, with the addition of jewels, you know, with some of the unique, unique jewels, it just went from like, you know, okay, yeah, it's a boss killer to look at it now. <laughs> yeah, look at me clear dry lake in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, guys, I'm sorry. I need like 30 seconds. I'll be right back, okay?
So what are you playing at the moment, Hedgy? Um, playing a proliferation trapper. It's actually quite good. Oh, uh, right. The the numbers are are good enough with the you know twenty percent increase at level twenty and the the adjustments on the right side with traps. I think it, it's it's in a good spot. I really like burning and shock proliferation together at the same time simultaneously. It makes it worth it. But right, man, right. I really cool. would like to play coal pr proliferation. I mean, it just feels so dead. And I understand like the freeze mine thing that that's it has been abused big time, and it cheeses the content. Yeah. But I mean, we've seen quad cursing nearly <laughs> shutting down all mobs. And you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there's a I mean, that's one of the trickiest things for me is whenever I'm doing a boss fight. It's like, okay, if I really want to make this fight actually challenging for people, it needs to be immune to, or like 90% reduced curse effect and 90% reduced freeze and chill effect and all that jazz. So, Okay, um, I'm sorry. All good, all good. Okay, so what was the last question you asked? I, I'm so sorry. Oh, we, we were talking about threshold jewels. Threshold jewels, okay, cool. Uh, all right. I was just curious, who's who's in charge of... Uh, the radius and if the tree needs shifting, like the actual visual, and I guess it applies to jewels now because it's a big deal whether mm -hmm. something is or isn't in the radius. Is that is that Nick too, or is that Mark, Nick, you? Um, it, it'll be whoever's doing the changes to the tree at the time, which recently has been me on uh, quite a bit. Um, okay. So he's he's always checking that stuff. We have a special thing in our tree editor when we're editing the tree, which shows all of the radiuses on the tree at once. So we know if we move this slightly, it's going to be within these circles at large radius and not at small and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, which we always take into account. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely something we we always think about and always make sure we're not giving some Too crazy much. combinations. Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems a little weird because uh, for a long time. You know, without the jewels and without radius jewels, you know, you could just add a cluster, you know, not add a cluster with like no, you know, drawbacks or anything wrong with it. But now you actually, it, it almost feels like it's kind of limited now. Like you guys have to stay in the dimensions of the tree that exists right now. Mm. It was a big, when we were adding radius jewels, that was a big question of whether like whether the benefit we get from these interesting radius jewels measures up to all the restrictions we're putting on ourselves and what we could do in the tree in future. And it was decided, um, like general, the general opinion was that it was worth the, the risk that we were taking with this. Um, it's something we're always thinking about, but um, it, it seems to have paid off for the most part just because of the few really interesting radius jewels that people really like. Yeah, I actually finally, finally, I I have a build that um, uses intuitive leap that could actually <laughs> save multiple points, and that was awesome. like awesome. that was one of the like intuitive leap when it was released was such an exciting jewel mm, concept. But then, yeah. yeah, the concept is so exciting. But then when it came to actual like you know, you know, in, using it, it was difficult. And now, yep. now in the shadow tree, the one area that everyone is so so negative about i'm like oh cool i'll just come down this way free power power charge life frenzy charge uh nullification easy like it saves me i think three points in total which is you know awesome so good good it's all part of the plan we just did it for you yeah thanks yeah. I appreciate in regards it. to the the threshold jewels like just my personal opinion of it is you know i think one of them is pretty pretty damn good and end game applicable which is the ground slam one which increases the radius cuz you know obviously people love more aoe and more radius so yeah. they can justify its use i think these threshold jewels would be awesome for like i don't know quest rewards or you know finding it in a race but it's so like unlikely that you're going to get the one that you need and you're going to be pathing that way you know, I would I would probably get excited if I found it at the very beginning of the league because I could use it then. But I, most likely, I would just phase myself out of them. And I mean, if that's the current intent, then I guess it's on point. Yeah, it's 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 hard to say. It's it's sort of a everyone has their own philosophy on how they should be used and what the best best role in the game for them is. Uh, 
I would like it if players get more customization over their skills that are skill specific. Support gems are great, but they are also they have to be very general. They have to apply to multiple skills. It's so cool that we finally get to do skill specific stuff. But mm -hmm. then that's also like not everyone will use it and not everyone even if it wasn't a unique, even if it was just a thing you could toggle on or off, that's development time you're spending. I mean, yeah, when you think of the the budgeting, so how much right. for all the programmer time and art time required are we adding to the game which could be spent on making another boss or making another skill entirely or a new crazy unique item like programmers time is valuable to us designers is there any one programmer out there that that you have to run all your ideas by like or is that, is that jonathan or is that somebody else um actually like, it's mark mark at the moment is uh We've got two new programmers who are awesome, uh, but we still need to run stuff by Mark, seeing as he knows the game the best, or knows the knows the skill side of it the best. He knows all the skills in the game and what's going to happen when we add the skill or another. Um, so most of the stuff goes through him at the moment. Though so, uh, we're hoping that soon the the new programmers who are already doing really well will know enough of that stuff that we can go to any of them. So yeah. At the moment, Mark has a huge amount of power, and all the he spends most of his time just <laughs> talking to the designers as they throw their horrifying ideas by him. He's the president. He can veto anything. He'd be like, nope, it's not going to work, Rory. Go back to the drawing board. <laughs> there ends up, we end up spending a long time having to convince him of some of the uh, crazy <laughs> ideas sometimes. Oh, yeah. man. I, I love that, that you guys got to fight for what you believe in. <laughs> You're like, come on, come on. You're like... Give him a cupcake in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is he in a good mood right now? Yeah. I've got a really bad skill to get by. <laughs> so, uh, Hedgy, do you do you have any other questions or? Yeah, I mean, on that kind of note, is there any one thing that you you try to implement that got shot down by either graphical limitation, programming limitation, uh, or are you not allowed to talk about that in case it gets released later? <laughs> Most things have just taken a new form, like we've just found a different way to do it or make use use of it. There's um, some variations, things like trying to fill out a cycle of, you know, we've got this one skill for this one specific element. What happens if we add a cold and a lightning version? Those skills have often fallen flat just because we do, we're we don't have a cool idea to start with. We're just trying to make something to fill the gap. Those generally tend to fall apart. But if we're making a skill from scratch, uh, I've been doing this long enough that I kind of know whether it's going to work before we start work on it. Uh, and so it's not as bad. Uh, occasionally we've had things like originally uh, Storm Call and Glacial Cascade were the same skill. You got like a, a Glacial Cascade that went to your location for a duration and then exploded. Um, wow. <laughs> and those that ended up being amazing. split into two skills because they were there was just too much going on in one skill. Um, <laughs> Which I think uh, that's a very, very easy temptation when designing a skill is to just throw everything in it. I think Reeve was the first skill I ever designed, and my original design had like life in mana on hit as well because it was like stealing stuff from them, and it had some other some other benefit like the the duration also. I mean the damage, but you got a damage bonus that applied to your next hit and all sorts of stuff, and we ended up cutting out ninety percent of that. Um, and to get the much more, well, it was supposed to be a level two skill at the time, so it was supposed to be really simple, but I turned it into something crazy because you're so it's so tempting to do that. You just want to add everything to it. Um, so there's a lot of stuff where it's like the skill does nothing like what it was originally intended to do, but it's now a lot better for it, hopefully. All right. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. We really appreciate you coming on. I do have one last question. It's simple. Oh, yes? Cake or pie? Um, um, I would have to say some combination of the two, maybe. That's a cop out. Uh, uh, <laughs> I said neither. I don't want. I don't want. I really don't want to draw the ire of the cake or the pie demographics here. Like we're trying to appeal to everyone. So wow, uh, pie cake. It's pie. The answer is pie. <laughs> There's an answer to that too. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, again, thank you very much, Rory. Uh, Hegemony, anything you'd like to add before we no, man, head out? I, I love talking to Rory and all the developers. I, I really do appreciate all the time that you know you put in, all the hard work, and that you're actually listening to the player base. And it's 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 a good feeling. And I love that 
that ecology that you did at the New Zealand Game Developers Conference. If you guys don't know what that is and you want to understand what R Rory does on a day-to-day -day basis in a simplistic form, check out that little PowerPoint. We'll go ahead and link that in the YouTube description. But uh, yeah, thank you, Rory, for all that you do and uh, donating your time. Um, all good. Thanks for having me, guys. One one thing, if I can pimp pimp something of my own before Do we it. head yeah, off. Yeah, sure. Go for um, it. I've been working on a card-based RPG, uh, like tabletop RPG for a while now, and we recently played it on uh, one of the guys at work's podcast, like their own personal podcast that they have. So Gamer, you check Front out... Gamer. Yep, that's mm -hmm. the one. If you check out the most recent episode of Front Seat Gamer, or at least it was the most recent one at the time, um, you can hear me and uh, a friend and a couple of the guys from the podcast playing through my game that I've been working on. So uh, check that out, if you will. What's it called? And, nice. Uh, the game, the working prototype of the game is Seven Gates. Um, Awesome. And yeah. so, yeah. Have yeah, we'll have a link Chris? to that in the description, too. We'll check it out. <laughs> I, I haven't listened to Front Seat Gamer in a little bit, but I did listen to a lot of it. I've, yeah. I like to binge listen. <laughs> I like That's to sweet. listen to a lot of those, too. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank you again, Rory. Everyone, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye-bye. See ya. Peace.